We are now on chapter 1.4. And let's get started. 1.4, matter, the stuff of chemistry. See, remember we talked before, we said matter was just basically stuff, right? We just said it was the stuff. Now we're going to be more specific. Now, take a look at this picture. I think it's kind of a cool picture. Just kind of found it. Uh, what I did was I searched stuff on a, a website that has royalty-free uh, photographs for use in academics. And this is what it showed me. I'm like, yeah, that is just a pile of stuff right there. <laughs> Got some knives and tools and scissors and stuff. It's just a really kind of a strange picture. But how else would you describe what you're seeing? You just say, this is a bunch of stuff. <laughs> it's just a bunch of stuff. But stuff, well, it most definitely is. But let's be a little more specific. Instead of saying stuff, you know, maybe we can be a little bit better than that. So let's take a look. Matter, mass stuff okay sorry i make myself laugh sometimes mass anything that takes up space can also be placed on a scale and weighed mass is a measure of the amount of material in an object mass is the amount of material in an object hmm interesting it's the amount of material it's the amount of stuff that's present in a material it's the amount of matter that's present in a material common unit for that is grams. Grams, kilograms, milligrams. So if you have a little bit of stuff, you weigh it in grams. If you have very little stuff, measure it in milligrams. If you have a whole lot of stuff, measure it in kilograms. That's kind of how it works. Pretty fun, huh? Now, weight is not the same thing. Weight and mass are different. Weight is actually the force of gravity acting upon the stuff. Okay, so it's a little bit different there. It's a little bit weird, right? Mass is how much matter is present. Weight is the pull of gravity on that object, on that stuff, on that matter. Okay? Now, on Earth, you know, as long as you an object is weighed in roughly the same location on the Earth's surface, its mass and weight will have the same measured value. Okay? Depending on the units, of course. Maybe the units will be different. But on Earth, they're basically the same. But the definitions are different. Mass is how much stuff is present. Weight is is the force of gravity acting on that stuff, on that matter. Length. Length is a measure of distance from one point to another. That's the definition. Common metric unit for that is length, is meter. Centimeter, kilometer, decimeter, all that stuff. So if you have a little ways to go, maybe measure it in meters. If you have a very little way to go, measure it in millimeters. If you have a long way to go, measure that in kilometers. Volume. Now, volume, we generally measure volume. Well, first of all, volume is a three-dimensional uh, measure of the space matter takes up or the space that matter needs to exist. So, so far, we've decided that matter has mass and also matter occupies space. Matter has volume. So, volume is a three-dimensional measure of the space occupied by matter. Typically, in chemistry, we measure ma uh, volume in milliliters or liters. From time to time. So we have a little bit of volume, milliliter. A whole lot of volume, liters. That's how you want to do that. Now there is kiloliters, but most people don't use it. Now, in the clinical setting, you may come across this. Cubic centimeters. There we go. Cubic centimeters. CC, or centimeter cubed. So now, here's a fun fact. One milliliter equals one centimeter cubed equals one C dot C. Centimeter cubed, centimeter cubed, milliliter. All three of those measurements are the same thing. It's describing the same thing. So one milliliter is a centimeter cubed. So if you were in a hospital setting and you heard the doctor scream, push five cc's of Ativan stat. Five cc's is five milliliters. Okay, that's just what it means. Pretty cool, huh? I'm sure you've heard all that saying before on the medical dramas on TV, you know? Push 5 cc stat. CC is a milliliter. Pretty cool, huh? Now, it leads us to this thing called density. Density is a comparison, also called a ratio, of a substance's mass to its volume. D equals M over V. Mass over volume. D equals mass over volume. Now, one gram of water will have the mass of one milliliter. One gram of water has the mass of one milliliter. So the density of water, D, 
of H2O is 1.00 grams per milliliter. That is the density of water. Now, densities of objects don't normally change very much. Um, in this class, we say they don't change at all, even though they may slightly change. Um, so you can use it to uh, determine what something is, an unknown substance or something like that. And we can also use it as a conversion factor. Density can be used as a conversion factor. And I'm going to show you how it's very simple and it's very nice. Okay? So right now, density is grams over milliliters, grams divided by milliliters. Water has a density of 1.00 gram per milliliter. And that's how it works so far. Now, let's say we want to work out this question right here. What is the density in grams per centimeter cubed? Remember, one centimeter cubed equals one milliliter. Remember that. So a centimeter cubed is a milliliter. See, simple enough, right? All right, so we want to find the density. We know density is mass over volume. Okay, we know that so far. Density is mass over volume. The mass is 48.0 grams. The volume equals 13.3 milliliters. Density is mass over volume, so the mass is 48.0 grams divided by 13.3 milliliters equals. All right. Grab out your calculator. Let me see here. Use my phone as my calculator. There we go. 48 divided by 13.3 equals 3.61 grams per milliliter. And that's the density of this metal object that we're working with. Okay, pretty simple, right? Just divide the mass by the volume to get density. Now, let's try this question together. An unknown liquid has a density of 1.32 grams per milliliter. So they're giving us the density. So density equals 1.32 grams per milliliter. Volume equals 14.7 grams. All right. So far, so good, guys. What is the volume? Oops. Did I, did I say volume? I'm so sorry, guys. Mass. There we go. Volume is actually the question mark. And it wants the, I guess we'll put it in milliliters, right? There we go. So we have grams. That's the given unit, right? Multiplied by something to give us volume. And there's volume. Milliliters is a volume unit, right? All right. So we know that the grams will go on the bottom. The milliliters will go on the top. Remember, we learned that before in dimensional analysis. That's exactly what we're doing right here. We're doing dimensional analysis, just using density as our conversion factor. See, the grams are canceling, right? That's good. Now, here's our conversion factor right there. Let me get a different color just to emphasize this. This density is 1.32 uh, grams over milliliters, right? 1.32 grams over 1 milliliter or... 1 milliliter over 1.32 grams. That's what it means. Okay? So this means that and that. I hope you understand that. That's very important. Okay? So now, let me get uh, rid of those arrows. There we go. Now let's put some numbers in. We know we're starting with 14.7 grams. So 14.7 goes there. 1.32 goes here, and the number 1 goes here. Notice, 1.32 is with the unit grams. 1.32 grams. 1 is with the milliliters. 1 milliliters. Okay? And that leads us in the unit we want, milliliters. So let's take out our handy-dandy calculators. 14.7, divide all that by 1.32, equals... 11.1 .1 milliliters. All right? Now, I know this is a little weird because you're probably not thinking of density as a conversion factor. You're probably getting a little freaky-deaky on me there. Don't let it. It's simply a dimensional analysis with a conversion with a uh, conversion factor being the density of something. Okay? They're just units, guys. Don't let these things get a little bit uh, mystical on you. They're simply units. Very, very simple. Very, very simple. 
If you didn't understand that, please go back and watch it again and try it on your own. All these problems we do together online on the video, you should do on your own. Make sure you get them. Obviously, they're important because I'm taking my time to film this. Specific gravity. All right. Let me just move this out of the way a little bit. Specific gravity. Now, liquid densities are often measured with respect to water. Now, remember water's density, the density of H2O is 1.00 grams per milliliter, right? So the density of water is one gram per milliliter, essentially, okay? Liquids are generally measured with respect to water. They're generally measured that way. Now, we're going to use this thing called specific gravity. Now, specific gravity is the density of a sample of anything. Usually it's a liquid, but anything could have a specific gravity. Density of a liquid divided by the density of water. The density of a liquid divided by the density of water. Okay? So let's say, for example, we had a piece of metal. And its density was 13.6 grams per milliliter any i just made that up i just picked a number and the units okay so it's a metal that's its uh, density no big deal if i want the specific gravity of that metal i simply take the density of the metal or the sample 13.6 grams per milliliter divide that by the density of water which i already told you is one gram per milliliter now watch what happens the units cancel. The units are canceling. Wait a minute now. If the units are canceling, there are no units. They're gone. They canceled, right? Oops. I'm sorry, guys. Let me go back. My finger just touched the wrong button there. The units are gone. They they cancel, right? So it was, I don't know, what was it? 13.3 grams per milliliter was the density of our, of our metal. 0.3 grams per milliliter. And the density of water. Get back to where we were here and the units cancel, right? Oh, my face is in the way. <laughs> Sorry about that. There we go. Move myself out of the way. Okay? All right, let's go back over that. Sorry about that. We'll do the whole thing again because I was in the way. Equals 13.3 grams per milliliter. 1.00 grams per milliliter. Units cancel. Okay? So specific gravity is literally a unitless number. Literally, it has no units. And the specific gravity of this metal is 13.3. No units. Because the units cancel. Because specific gravity is the density of a sample divided by the density of water, and the units cancel themselves out, leaving you with simply a number. Pretty cool, huh? Now, generally speaking, generally speaking, if you're given a specific gravity, say you have a, an object with a specific gravity equals 0 0.75. Okay? Generally speaking, you can simply say 0 0.75 grams per milliliter. You can just put the units back in because essentially, essentially, it's divided by the density of water, so the, the units simply just cancel. That's simply what a, a specific gravity is. Now, specific gravity is normally measured with this instrument called a hydrometer, and that's usually used to measure like the density of urine, the density of alcoholic beverages, things like that, to determine sugar content, usually. Isn't that kind of neat? They determine sugar content that way. That's one way to do it. So, oh, that's kind of neat. I like chemistry. It's pretty cool. All right, temperature. Now, temperature is measured using this thing called a thermometer. We all know that, right? Thermometers are generally met, used to measure how hot or cold something is. So temperature is basically telling us about the hotness or coldness of an object. That's essentially what temperature is. Now, there are numerous ways to measure temperature. There, are, well, In essence, there are three different ways we measure temperature. One is with the Fahrenheit scale. Now, we're all familiar with the Fahrenheit scale in this country. Um, we're not going to use it at all. So let's just put a line through it. Just don't even worry about the Fahrenheit scale. Just, eh, whatever. It's gone. We are going to worry about the Celsius scale, and we are going to worry about this thing called the Kelvin scale. Okay? Now, Celsius is based on water. 
Water will boil at 100 degrees Celsius. It'll freeze at zero degrees Celsius. That's water. Kelvin, on the other hand, is not based on water. Kelvin is based on this um, um, phenomenon or this uh, theoretical uh, temperature called absolute zero. Okay? Absolute zero is the coldest um, theoretically achievable temperature in the universe. And Kelvin is based on that. So the Kelvin scale never goes below zero. If you hit zero Kelvin, you've reached what's called absolute zero, which means there's nothing colder than that. So all Kelvin temperatures are positive. Celsius can go negative. Fahrenheit can go negative. Kelvin cannot. Okay? And that's just how it works. So now, let's take a look here at these thermometers. 100 degrees Celsius is 373 degrees Kelvin. Zero degrees Celsius is 273 degrees Kelvin. So Kelvin is, a, is the same temperature, just a bigger number on the scale. Okay, Zero degrees Celsius and zero degrees Kelvin, uh, pardon me, 273 degrees Kelvin, it's the same amount of temperature that's in the product, in the water, for example. It's just the scales make the number different. So if you actually want it to convert, to uh, say, to Kelvin, uh, uh, sorry, let me back that up, to temperature Kelvin, that equals temperature Celsius plus 273. Simple little formula to convert to Kelvin. If you want to convert back to, from Kelvin to Celsius, it's just TK minus 273. Okay? That's to convert. Let me get rid of this line here so you don't think I'm dividing. All right? And that's simply to convert from Cal, uh, Cal, Celsius to Kelvin or Kelvin back to Celsius. Very, very simple. But keep that in mind. They're based on two different phenomena. Water is based on the, uh, Celsius is based on the freezing and the boiling point of water, where Kelvin is based on the, the uh, absolute zero, which is the coldest theoretically achievable temperature in the universe. Now, I've said that three or four times. It might be on the exam. Energy. Now, energy is one of these cool things we have to talk about. Energy comes in two main varieties, potential and kinetic. Potential energy is energy that is not being used at this moment. Kinetic energy is energy that's being used at this moment. It's moving. Some people say potential energy is energy that's not moving. or I say it's not being used. Kinetic energy is energy that's moving. I say it's being used. Because in order to have kinetic energy, something has to move. Um, and kinetic energy, something is moving. Energy is being used to cause it to move. Now, there's this thing called the law of conservation of energy, which means energy is never created and it is never destroyed. It's just converted. So it, goes, it can either be converted to potential energy or to kinetic energy, but you never lose it. It always goes somewhere. Okay. Now, in chemistry, we have this thing called the calorie. You've heard of the calorie. The calorie is the energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. That is what a calorie is. Now, there's also this thing called a nutritional calorie. Let's see if I can get my pen to work here. A nutritional calorie. Now, a nutritional calorie is 100 times larger than an actual calorie. Now, look up here. See how I have them written out like this? Capital C calorie is a nutritional calorie. It's abbreviated with a capital C. A heat calorie, or a like you can also call it a chemistry calorie if you like, but they're called heat calories, is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. That's a calorie. That's a lowercase c calorie. And this is also known as a kcal or a kilocalorie. All right? So one capital C calorie is one kcal, okay? One capital C calorie equals one kcal, which stands for kilocalorie. Kilo, remember, kilo is a thousand. I keep getting my head in the way, guys. I'm sorry. Uh, one calorie is one kilocalorie. One kilocalorie. Very, very simple, but that's how it works. This is what we're talking about, okay? Heat and specific heat. Now, heat is the kinetic energy flowing from a warmer body to a colder one. Okay? Heat is basically energy moving from hot to cold. That is heat. Pretty neat, huh? 
Now, every substance has the ability to absorb or lose heat as the temperature changes. Specific heat, or specific heat of a substance, is the amount of heat needed to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. Remember a calorie? A calorie was defined to be the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So uh, calories are based on water. Specific heat doesn't rely on water. It could be any substance, okay? So things like metals have low specific heats. You can warm those up or cool those down fast. That's a good thing, right? Uh, having a low specific heat means you're, you can transfer energy into you quickly. That means things like frying pans, pots are made of metal. Why is that? Transfers heat easily, has a low specific energy, specific heat, pardon me. Um, things that have a high specific heat are insulators. Some things like your oven mitts would have a fairly high specific heat. It takes a long time for energy to transfer through them. That's a good thing so you don't burn your hands. Um, water uh, has a very high specific heat. It's one calorie. You know, it's one calorie, right? The specific heat, basically. But still, that's a lot, you know? Um, ceramic sometimes can have a very high specific heat. It just depends on the substance, all right? And that's what specific heat is. States of matter. You've all heard of them. Now we're going to talk a little bit about them. States of matter is the physical form in which the matter exists. There you go. Solid, liquid, gas. Those are the three states of matter. Solid, liquid, gas. Well, of course, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. The particles in a solid are tightly packed together and moving only slightly. So in a solid, the little... I'm oh, sorry, my light just turned off again. In a solid... Hello, there we go. In a solid, the particles are in a fixed location. They can't really move in relationship to each other, but they kind of just vibrate in place. It's kind of in place. They can't go anywhere. If they could, a solid would be would be uh, able to flow and move around. Solids can't. The desk I'm sitting at, it's solid. It's going to be here tomorrow. It's going to be here next week, hopefully. Now, a solid has what they call a definite shape and a definite volume. Now, that means that its shape and volume will not change unless somebody acts on it and takes a chainsaw to my desk or something. Hopefully, they don't do that. Okay? Now, in a liquid, liquids are far less ordered, and those particles are moving freely with each other. Okay? They're still close together, but now they can move around. It's like being at a party, and you're the social butterfly mingling with all the people that are there. Okay? In a solid, you're not mingling. You're kind of all just standing in the same location at the party. A liquid, man, you're mingling. You're saying how you do to all the people around you. That's more of a liquid setup. You're still all kind of close together, but you're all free to move around each other. Not a big deal. Okay? That's a liquid. Now, gases, on the other hand, they have no fixed arrangement. And uh, Oh, one thing. Oh, back to liquids real quick. Sorry. Liquids have a definite volume, but they'll take the shape of their container. Now, let's think about that for a second. Imagine you had a one-gallon bucket of water. The water's volume is one gallon, and it's got the shape of a bucket. Pour that one gallon of water into your bathtub. Your bathtub will hold probably three or 400 gallons, you know, or maybe not that much. I have no idea how much it'll hold. But say your bathtub will hold 100 gallons. You have a one-gallon bucket of water. You pour it in the bathtub. It doesn't fill the entire volume of the bathtub, does it? It only fills the one gallon of the bathtub, and it takes the shape of the tub, all right? Liquids can do that. Their volume will not take up the entire volume of the container. You know, it doesn't have to, but it will take the shape of that container, okay? So one gallon of water from a bucket will take the shape of one ga of the bottom of the bathtub, essentially, but it certainly won't fill it, okay? Now, gases. Gases are the, say they're just like, just whizzing around. They're like, um, I don't know how to describe them. They're just like crazy fast moving particles that are far apart. Really kind of cool. Gases are really kind of cool. Now, gases are moving at high speeds, and every now and then they'll just randomly collide. Pretty neat, huh? <laughs> I think I think gases are wild, man. Every now and then they'll collide with each other, or they'll collide with the sides of the container. You know, imagine the room you're in. There's all kinds of gas in the room. The room you're in right now. At least I hope there is, or you can't breathe very well. So you're sitting in a room, and there's all these gas particles just whizzing around you, hitting you, hitting the walls, hitting everything. Right? We don't even feel them. Because, you know, we've you know, grown accustomed to them being there. In fact, if they weren't there, we'd be in big trouble. Now, that's really kind of cool. 
Now, a gas has no defined shape and no defined volume. What can you do? With a gas, you can make it take up the entire volume of its container. Or you can shrink it down to a really small container. Really, really cool. Imagine if you took all the gas in your room and you shrunk it down into a one liter bottle. And then if you took that one liter bottle and opened it up to the room, the gas would take up the entire volume of the room. Really, really cool. What shape is it going to take? Well, when it's compressed down to the one liter bottle, it takes the shape of the one liter bottle. When you unleash it to your room, it takes the shape of the room. Gases are cool, man. Liquids and solids are all right, but gases are cool. They do all kinds of cool stuff with gases. All right? So that's how that works. That's, those are the three states of matter. All right, let's take a look at this little uh, you try quiz. Identify each description as that of a particles of a liquid, uh, sorry, a solid, liquid, or a gas. A has def, uh, definite volume, but takes the shape of the container. Well, what has a definite volume that will take the shape of its container? Well, that's, that's a liquid, right? Liquids will have a definite volume. You can't change its volume, but you can change its shape. Particles are moving rapidly. Yeah, they're moving really fast. And they're banging off of things. Those are gases, right? Gases do that. Particles fill the entire volume of a container. Ooh, take up every, every, every square centimeter of that container. Well, that's a gas. Gases fill entire volumes. Particles have a fixed arrangement. Well, fixed arrangement means the particles aren't moving in relationship to each other. And that's a good thing for a solid to be because we need them to, to, you know, to hold us up, right? Like the floor or your chair. Particles are close together, but moving freely. Ooh, moving freely, huh? Well, moving freely are those people that are the social butterflies at a party. They're going from one person to another. Those are liquids. Liquids are moving freely. Solids aren't. Solids aren't. And particles are close together. Gases, the particles are far apart, so it can't be a gas. Solids, they're not free to move around, so it's, it's a liquid for sure. Isn't that fun? Man, this is great. Okay, that leads us to how matter changes, 1.6. So we'll end this video here, and we'll come back, and we'll do 1.6.